So we are starting a series today that will take about nine weeks to complete. And it's a series that I'm calling the Culture of Discipleship. And what, we're, what we want to look at is this, this concept, this idea of discipleship. Because it's really important that we see discipleship, that we understand what a disciple is, and we see discipleship, that is becoming a disciple, as something that isn't optional for a Christian. It's important that we see that this isn't some program that we add as to our church activities. But being a disciple is our identity. And if it's our identity, that means the way we are disciples develops our culture. And we really want to be not just a church, but a culture of discipleship. We want to be those who follow after Jesus and help other people follow after Jesus. In fact, it's really important for us to understand the difference between what it means to be a disciple and what it simply means to be religious. Religion is basically our attempt at relating to God. I'm going to attempt to relate to God. That's what religion is. And religion, no matter what form it takes, can cause pride. It can be where we, we think I'm doing pretty well. I think I'm better than others. Religion can cause, uh, cause disillusionment. That mindset that says, you know, I'm not really experiencing what I expected. I wanted something different out of this. And it can even, it can even cause bitterness. We can even become religious people who are just bitter because we think this thing makes me miserable. That's religion. That's not Christianity. Yes, I know in a technical sense Christianity is a religion. I understand that. But that's not really biblical Christianity. That's not what it means to follow Jesus. In contrast to religion, following Jesus causes humility. Because anyone who's tried to follow Jesus knows, I cannot do this on my own. The standard that Jesus sets for us is way beyond my ability. So it causes humility. Also, it causes thankfulness. Following Jesus causes us to recognize God's at work even in bad things. God's working good even in the bad things in our life. There's a thankfulness that comes with following Jesus. And it even causes Pleasure. You know, the psalmist says, uh, speaking of the Lord, uh, at your right, he says, oh, I just lost this first part of the verse. Oh, I hate when that happens. The second part says, at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. In your presence is fullness of joy. Boom. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. That's what he says. We recognize as we follow Jesus that every good thing in our life comes from him. And is at its best when it's submitted unto him. So we're not talking about religion. When we're talking about a culture of discipleship, we're not talking about just our own brand of religion. How does Servants Church do religion? That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about what God calls all Christians to be. Jesus followers. To follow after Him. Now in Mark chapter 10, Jesus is basically sending out the disciples. They're, they're going from being just disciples to also being apostles. Sent out ones. He, he basically is sending them on their first missionary endeavor and he's kind of being very specific about some of the challenges that they're going to experience. So he talks about the fact that they're going to experience great power. God's going to use them in supernatural ways, but also great persecution. People are going to reject them and think they're crazy and throw them out of the cities that they go to preach in. But when we pick it up in verse 24, as Jesus is continuing to kind of prepare them for these things, he also says a bunch of things that actually apply to us very specifically. This is where the commands to the apostles definitely fit for us as everyday you know, disciples. And starting in verse 24, he says this very simple statement. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor is a servant above his master. That's interesting because some of you might have a version that says a student is not above his teacher. But we need to know there's a big difference between being a student and being a disciple. A student receives information. And that is part of discipleship. We'll talk about that in weeks to come. But a disciple receives a lifestyle. 
A disciple is taught this is how you live your life. That includes receiving information, but it's much bigger than just information. And, and when the disciples heard this, when Jesus makes this point, he recognizes he's not the first person to have disciples. Jewish rabbis often had disciples. Jewish rabbis would go to young men who they thought might be promising for ministry, and they would say, why don't you come be my disciple? Come follow me. Learn how I do this. And they would learn information, but they would also learn a lifestyle of being a rabbi. What's interesting about Jesus is he didn't pick really the best candidates. <laughs> he didn't pick educated men. He didn't pick uh, men who were even intensely godly. He picked fishermen. He picked political extremists. He picked tax collectors, the worst, you know, scum of the universe in that first century. And he said to them, come follow me. And he, he makes a statement. He wants us to be clear. Listen, I'm calling you to be disciples. I want to teach you a lifestyle. It was actually non-Christians that identified disciples as Christians. Now we see this in Acts chapter 11 verse 26. It says, And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. So Antioch is where one of the early churches was. They're going out and they're preaching Jesus to all kinds of non-Jews. Lots of those non-Jews are becoming Christians. And what happens is they start getting persecuted. Oh, you're just trying to be little Jesuses. We're going to call you Christians, which means like a little Christ. It was a, it was a, a snub. It was a byword. So it wasn't Jesus who called his followers Christians. It was the world who called his followers Christians. Nothing wrong with the, the name Christian. They took that as a badge of honor that they would be seen as someone like Jesus. But Jesus called his followers disciples. He says, I want to teach you a lifestyle. Not just some information. Not just some religious practices. And he says to these guys, look, it, it's enough that you become like your teacher, it's enough for a disciple to be like his teacher and a servant to be like his master. And he says, this is in verse 25, if they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of his household? Now Beelzebub was just a way to kind of say, there's a long explanation, but the short of it is, you're, you're one of the devil's kids, basically. And Jesus is saying, listen, if they said I'm of the devil, guess what they're going to say about you? In other words, Jesus is saying, listen, if you're going to follow after me, if you're going to be my disciple and receive my lifestyle, part of it means you're going to be vilified the way I was vilified. People are going to look down on you the way they look down on me. And then he says in verse 26, notice, therefore he says, do not fear them, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be made known. In other words, they're going to get away with vilifying you. Whatever I tell you in the dark, he says, speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. And he says, and do not fear those who kill, kill the body but cannot, uh, I'm sorry, but are not able to destroy both, I'm sorry, I lost my, 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 my sight. I need glasses, I think. He says, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, here's what he's, he's wanting these guys to recognize. When he says, shout from the rooftops, you need to know that was a normal activity. If we did that now, people would think we're crazy, okay? But that's the way you spread news. In that day, the houses had flat roofs, and so if you were going to a neighborhood and you had an important announcement from an authority to announce to that neighborhood, you would go to someone's house, may I make an announcement from your rooftop? They'd say, sure, please go ahead. He'd go on top and you'd say, here's what the king says. And so what Jesus is saying to his disciples, he's going, I'm teaching you stuff in private, but I intend you to share it in public. I intend, I want people to hear this. I want people to know what I'm about. So this doesn't mean that you need to crawl on your roof today and start shouting out, Jesus loves you. That's, you're going to look like a crazy person. Don't do that. But it does mean that if you're a Jesus follower, he intends you to share publicly with people what he's giving to you. And he says, there will be persecution for this. In fact, it's interesting because Jesus says, that he recognizes they're gonna, this is going to be intimidating. They're going to be afraid of this. He, rec he recognizes that there's a chance they could be killed for preaching Jesus, for talking about the kingdom of God like Jesus is training them to do. But he says to them, listen, don't fear the person 
who can kill the body but can't touch your soul. Rather, he says, fear him, that is God, who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. In other words, he's saying, listen, part of following me, he says, means being more concerned with judge, God's judgment than other people's judgment. This is really important. It's important because as far as Jesus is concerned, that seeing God as our righteous judge is a foundational thing. If you're going to be a Jesus follower, you have to recognize what Jesus wants you to recognize. And what he wants you to recognize is that ultimate judgment belongs to God. Which means, one, we're not overly critical of people, but also more than that, it means that we recognize God's going to judge us and God's going to judge everybody. He's the final judge. Not the person who wants to take my life. And because he's the final judge, I don't have to worry even if someone takes my life. Now this is a really important to think about because Proverbs says this, Proverbs 9.10 says this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. There are a lot of people who want to call themselves Christians today and they have no fear of God. They, they don't sense the reality that God is the judge. They don't even want to talk about God being the judge. But that's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, listen, I know it's going to be difficult. I know it's not going to be easy to go out and do what I'm calling you to do. But here's the reality. God's the judge. And the people who harm you aren't going to get away with that. And God's going to judge all people. And you should be way more concerned about God's judgment than somebody else's. It's also important that we recognize that we understand how God's judgment fits with his love. In fact, this is kind of how we grow in maturity. Let's listen to what uh, John the Apostle wrote in his epistle. John writes, In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That big word, propitiation, is just a word that means that, that Jesus became the sacrifice that satisfied God's wrath. That God's judgment was poured onto Jesus for our sake. He became that atoning sacrifice. He says, he goes on to say, love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. In other words, we're not worried about God casting us aside because we put our faith in Jesus and we believe what Jesus did for us on the cross was enough to pay for the judgment we deserve. He says, because as he is, that is, as Jesus is, so are we in the world. In other words, we're following Jesus now. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who, ha he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. So do you see how he's saying love and judgment come together? He's saying we know that God loves us because Christ died for us and took on our punishment that we deserve. That's God proving that he's love. Love's, uh, love's strong enough that has an unbreakable standard. Love's strong enough to atone for those who have broken the standard. And we mature in love. We are perfected in love by understanding how those things work together. God, I still reverence you. I fear you. You're the final judge. But I don't fear my own judgment because Christ has taken it on for me. Are you guys following me? So when Jesus says this to these guys though, remember this is before the cross. So when he says, fear him who judges, all they know is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. They still don't know how love and judgment work together. He goes on to say, verse, in verse 29, he says, are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground uh, apart from your father's will. But the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Do not therefore, do not fear therefore, he says, you are of more value than many sparrows. Do you see what Jesus is saying? He's saying, listen, okay, God cares about these little birds that you can buy two for a penny. But you're of much more value. Amen. Now I want you to think about this for a second. If two sparrows equal one penny, because the value of the sparrow is based on what has been paid for that, those sparrows. A half a penny for a sparrow. That's the value. What's been paid for you? 
Well, that's what the scripture says. Scripture says in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, Paul exhorts the leaders of the Ephesians church to shepherd the church of God, notice, which he purchased with his own blood. That's how valuable you are. Again, the disciples didn't know that extent of their value. They knew they were God's chosen people. These were all Jewish men that God chose, that Jesus chose. But they didn't understand the cross yet. This is before the cross. But still, we look at this, this side of the cross and we recognize that's the, that's the value God placed on us. He would send Christ to die for us. Guys, all this points to this. It all points to this question we have to answer. Is Jesus worthy of our suffering? If we're going to follow him, he says, if you're going to follow me, they're going to vilify you like they vilified me. <laughs> he says, if, 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 they're going to if you're going to follow me, you could be persecuted, even killed for this. You have to be assured that God's a just judge. If you're going to follow me, he's saying, listen, if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to measure your value the way I do. The way the Father does. He measures his value that you are one, not just made in the image of God, but someone for whom Christ died. That's where your value comes. Guys, listen, I don't know about you, but I can't think of anybody else worthy to follow more than this. Because even though this might cost my life, and even though people will vilify me, and even though it's difficult to follow Jesus, the truth is, no one has ever valued me the way the Father in Heaven has valued me by sending Jesus for me. No one. Even I have a great family. I have five kids that love me dearly. And yet, they don't value me as nearly as much as my Father in Heaven values me. Is Jesus worth, worthy of this, our suffering? That's what we have to answer. He goes on in verse 32, notice he says, Therefore, Jesus says, Whoever confesses me before men, him I also will confess before my Father who is in Heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in Heaven. And I want you to think about this. This, this word for confess, it's interesting when it says whoever confesses me. Literally, in the, the Bible was written in Greek. So literally in the Greek it says whoever confesses in me. It's kind of an awkward phrase. Whoever confesses in me. And it's said that way on purpose. It's as if Jesus is saying, listen, whoever confesses their oneness with me. Whoever identifies with me. In other words, whoever makes a profession from this oneness, who openly identifies me, that's the one who belongs to me. So when Jesus says, listen, uh, whoever confesses to me, I'll confess. Whoever denies me, I'll deny. He's basically saying, listen, following me means you openly identify with me. That, that's tricky, isn't it? Let's be honest, right? And, you know, it's, it's funny. Um, we will say, if someone asks us, are you a Christian? We'll say, well, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a Christian. We'll say that. But let's be honest. It's different when someone starts saying, oh, stinking Christians, man. Who do they think they are? They're the ones causing all the problems in Ireland. All these people want is the freedom for a woman to do with her body what she chooses. And the Christians are the ones that say abortion is wrong. It's always them. And they say this in front of you and you just go, mm. I'm not saying nothing. This is what we do. Now, I'm not saying the right response is to say, that's right, Christians say that. It is wrong! <laughs> I'm not saying you need to be that way, but we should say, well, actually, I'm a Christian too. And actually, the, the reason Christians think abortion is wrong is because we value life. <laughs> and we believe that that child is a life. And, you know, it's a, one made in the image of God, and we want to see it protected. It's not against women. It's, it's, it's against men and women. Or it's, it's for women, pro men and women who are in the womb. That's what it's about. And we want to follow Jesus and we know he loves children and we want to love children the same way. That's why we're also big into adoption and foster care because we know some of those kids need to be in better homes. That's confessing Jesus. That your worldview flows from your oneness with him. That's what it means. It's not just like, yeah, I'm a Christian. It's being willing to be identified with Jesus even when it's costly. And he goes on to say in verse 34, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. Now let me be clear. He doesn't mean he's coming to bring war. That's not the point. 
We do have a picture of Jesus in the book of Revelation. When he returns, he will return and bring judgment. And that is serious stuff. I'm not holding back on that at all. But what I'm saying is, what he's saying here, he's talking about his first coming. And what he's trying to say is, look, I'm going to come and it's not going to cause peace. It's going to cause conflict. This is why. What does he say? Verse 35. For I have come to set a man against his father, uh, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. Now, some of your versions might have that italicized, you know, the prince to the side, and that's because he's quoting something. He's quoting Micah chapter 7, verse 6. He's quoting Micah 7, 6. And what's going on in the book of Micah, the Old Testament book of Micah, is God's people, the nation of Israel, say they have a covenant with God, but they live in worship other gods. But within Israel, there was a remnant of real believers who wanted to love God. And the people who wanted to worship false gods that were in Israel, guess what they did? They persecuted the people who wanted to love God. And so Micah says, this is what's happened to Israel. That a man is, finds enemies in his own household. A man wants to live for God and love God in his house. But his parents think he's crazy and they persecute him. Or his children think he's crazy and they persecute him. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is what Jesus is talking about. It's interesting because he goes on to say in verse 37... He says, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. This is important because what Jesus is saying here is not that he doesn't want us to love our, our parents or our children or our spouses. Obviously, that's not the case. We've been seeing that in Ephesians, haven't we? That the very evidence that God's changing us is how we begin to love our families and our spouses and our friends and even our enemies. So it's how we love these people that shows that we're being changed. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying this. He's saying, listen. He's saying, if you're going to follow me, it means you've got to love me more than anyone else. See, the truth is, we're only really loving Jesus when he becomes both our motive and our model for loving other people. And I've got a secret to tell you, a little secret. Let you in a little secret. When you do this, when you love your neighbor and your friend and your spouse and your kids and your parents because you know how much God loves you, it actually makes your love for those people better. I've said this a, a hundred times. I never get sick of saying it. Sarah and I have a great marriage, not because we're so stupid in love, though we are kind of stupid in love still, <laughs> but because we know we have to love Jesus more than we love each other. And it's in loving, both wanting to love Jesus more than we love each other and wanting to love Jesus more than we love our kids. And, and trust me, it's tempting to love each other more and tempting to love our kids more. But in loving God more than that, loving Jesus more than that, you know what happens? We get closer together. And Jesus is saying, this is what it means. If you're going to follow me, you've got to love me first. That's the only way it's going to work. Then he gives this phrase that, again, for us sounds a bit familiar, but for the disciples would have sounded really odd. Verse 38, he says, And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Now, when Jesus starts talking about the cross, this is the first time the cross is mentioned in the New Testament. When he starts talking about the cross, we read that and we go, oh yeah, Jesus was crucified. I got to pick up my cross. They had no clue Jesus was going to be crucified. So his disciples are hearing this idea about them picking up their cross and they're going, oh. Now they know he means martyrdom, but martyrdom as a soldier, there's something honorable in that. Okay, Jesus, he's God's chosen king. He's going to come. He's going to defeat the Romans. We'll fight with Jesus. Yeah, we're not afraid. We'll have to, we'll die for him if we have to. They'll make that kind of profession throughout the Gospels. But when he says you have to be crucified, that's a dishonoring way to die. In fact, some Jews felt like you weren't actually, you kind of were no longer part of God's covenant people if you're crucified. Because cursed is him who hangs on a tree, the scripture says. So to be crucified, they're like, okay, the cross. I don't know. Not just die, but die a dishonorable death? I, I don't know. 
Then he goes on to say, hey, and not only that, if you want to save your life, you're going to lose it. You have to be willing to lose your life. But if you lose your life, you'll save it. Now, when they heard this, they probably would have thought of resurrection. Again, not Jesus' resurrection because it hadn't happened yet, but their own resurrection. Now, we know this because we do know that the Jews of the first century already believed in a bodily resurrection. That when they would die, they would be resurrected into God's new kingdom. They actually already believed that. We know that from... Um, John's Gospel, chapter 11, is one of the reasons we know that. Listen to this. It says, Martha, now this is when Lazarus died. You guys might know that story in John 11 when Lazarus dies. And his sister Martha says to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whether you ask of God, whatever you ask of God, he'll, he will give you. In other words, I know that if you ask God to resurrect him, he'd resurrect him. And Jesus said to Martha, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at that last day. Okay, yeah, Lord, I know there's a resurrection coming. And then Jesus says to her this, listen. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? So, so interesting because the disciples here in Matthew chapter 10 verse 39 uh, would have thought, okay, he's talking about the resurrection. Yeah, we're all going to resurrect. We're, we're God's covenant people. We die, we, get, we resurrect. That's what happens. But he's talking about something greater than that. The resurrection, yes, but living in resurrection power now. You find your life when you lay it down. See, all this in verses 32 to 39, begs this question. Not just, is Jesus worthy of our suffering? Is Jesus worthy of our allegiance? Can we openly identify with him? Can we love him more, actually, than we love anybody else? Are we willing to embrace our own death and resurrection? That's what he's calling these men to do. That's normal discipleship. It's a big question, isn't it? It's just bigger than religion, isn't it? <laughs> now, in the rest of uh, chapter 10, he gets into some, again, some really specific instructions for them, really wanting to encourage them in, in, in what their authority is as his messengers. That's the rest of chapter 10, if you want to read it later. And in, in chapter 11, it opens up with Jesus honoring the ministry of John the baptizer. And if you don't know who that is, you can read it up that uh, on your own time later on. But basically, he's, he, he announces how great John the baptizer was because John the baptizer was in prison and, and was going, oh man, did I get it wrong with the, who the Messiah was? And it's a whole story. You can read it yourself. And towards the end, he starts talking about how in the cities where the apostles will go to preach Jesus, Jesus, to preach the kingdom, that many of those cities will reject it. They'll go, nah, Jesus isn't the Messiah, and they'll reject that. And Jesus pronounces a rule of serious judgment on those cities. He says, woe to you, because you've rejected my messengers. It's a big deal. So Jesus pronounced those woes. So he says these kind of pretty heavy things, and then we get in verses 25 to 30, words that are only found in Matthew's gospel. That again, really apply to us who are considering being Jesus followers. Listen to what he says. Matthew 11, verse 25. It says, at that time, Jesus answered and said, he prays now. And he says, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you did not, uh, I'm sorry, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in your sight. Now, it's important that we recognize that in Jesus' prayer, he's contrasting two kinds of people. Wise and prudent are one type. Babes are another. Now, babes don't mean like, you know, yeah, they're good looking. <laughs> it means like babes as in immature. We'll talk about what we mean by this, okay? So, prudent means basically you're able to mentally reason things. You, you're, you have a, a measure of intelligence, Babes literally means you're unable yet to speak. You're a toddler. You just kind of gaga goo goo all the time. Prudent means those who are, speaks of those who are confident in their abilities. I can figure it out. I know what I'm doing. Babes are those who are completely dependent upon others. 
And you guys know what it's like. If you have toddlers or you work in Sunday school, what do kids do? Do they say, please, may I have a drink of water? No, they go, eh. And you've got to figure out what that means because they can't get the water themselves. The prudent, therefore, speaks of those who trust in themselves. And babe speaks of those who trust in Jesus. Now what Jesus is doing there is he's wanting to make sure his, in, in this prayer, this very public prayer, he's wanting to make sure that these guys recognize, listen, you don't have to be a genius to follow Jesus. Now let me be really clear. Intelligence has nothing to do with following Jesus, which also means that you can be very intelligent and follow Jesus. You don't throw your intelligence out to follow Jesus. And the great news is, God wants us to think. It's part of how we worship God. We worship God with our minds. We want to think. So being intelligent isn't a hindrance unless you're like the wise and prudent where you go, yeah, I got this figured out. I'm confident in my abilities. I trust in myself. <coughs> then you're in trouble. And so Jesus is he's praying this way and he goes on to say in verse 27, he goes on to pray. He says, all things have been delivered to me by my Father and no one knows the Son, speaking of himself, except the Father, speaking of God the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. And what Jesus is saying there, and this is really important to understand, is he's basically saying, listen, more than just evidence... More than just proof that Jesus is God become man. More than just proof that the book, the testimony of God is trustworthy. More than just evidence that God has, Jesus has indeed risen from the dead. Though all those things are available and good and useful, more than that, he is saying, he is praying, what you need is God to reveal himself to you. You need me to reveal God to you. In other words, Jesus is saying, listen, if you're going to follow me, you need to see me as the revelation of God. To follow Jesus is never, it's never enough to say he's a good moral teacher. He's, he's, you can't, it's not even enough, listen, it's not even enough to say that Jesus is a prophet of God, even a sinless prophet of God. Our Muslim friends believe that. Yep. To be a follower of Jesus means we have to believe he is the revelation of God. He is the revealer of God. The only reason we know God is real is because Jesus came on the scene. The only reason we know God is good is because of the, the works of Jesus. He's the revelation of God. And Jesus is, is he's praying this. He's saying, you need to understand this. If you know Jesus, it's because God's opened your eyes to him. And that's a really encouraging thing. It's an encouraging thing because if God's opened your eyes to who Jesus is, guess what that means? It means he wants to continue to walk with you in relationship. It means he wants you to be his. Then he goes on to say in verses 28 to 30, he says, notice, Come to me, all who, who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Do you see how these... God's work and our work work together. He says, look, you're only going to know who God, what God's like. You're only going to know who I am and who the Father is if God wills to reveal himself to you. But guess what? You have a choice to make. You're going to come to me. So guys, listen, this is important because I, I'm, my, one of my con biggest concerns when I have to face God is I'm going to face God and God's going to say, you know, John, you know, well done, good and faithful servant. Let me bring up a couple things. <laughs> One of them is, many people went to your church for many years who knew of me but never knew me. Ouch. And I, I don't want to face God with that. So in all seriousness, listen, Jesus is saying, listen, if you know about me, you know about me because... I've willed that you know about me. I've given you that revelation. And if you know about me, now here's the choice you have to make. Will you come to me? And when he says, notice in, in the first part of verse 28, he says, Come to me, Jesus says. Later in verse 29, he says, Take my yoke uh, upon you and learn from me, he says, verse 29, For I am gentle and lowly in heart. 
Do you see what Jesus is doing? He's telling his disciples, he's telling anyone who's willing to come to him, look, I'm asking you to trust my character. Can I ask you a real serious question? Can you see any value in trusting in the character of an historical figure? Well, there was this guy once, he did some really good things. He's dead, but I trust his character. What character? He's dead. Whatever character he had is gone. If all there is is a material world. But when Jesus says, listen, when he says to these people who are listening to him, I want you to take my yoke upon me. I want you to trust me. Come to me. It's me I want you to come to. It's me I want you to trust. Jesus is saying, I want you to trust my character. I'm gentle. I'm humble. I'm not going to cast you aside. I'm, I'm accessible. <laughs> it's completely countercultural for any leader to call themselves lowly in heart. Nobody would have ever done what Jesus did just there. But he wants to be clear to them. Listen, I have the kind of character that makes me accessible. You can come to me. You can come to me. You can trust me, he's saying. And what is he offering them? He says, listen, come to me. I will give you rest, he says at the end of verse 28. And also toward the end of verse 29, he says, and you will find rest for your souls. Now, interesting that Jesus here is calling people who need rest to find rest in him. Do you know who needs rest more than anybody else? Do you know who feels the most heavy burdened? Religious people. And, and I say that as someone who is a Jesus follower but can easily fade into religion. Where I'm just kind of doing all the do's and the don'ts. And those do's and don'ts become this massive, heavy burden. And you never find any rest for your souls. He's just saying, don't you understand? I can imagine the disciples having come back from this really intense kind of missionary journey and him, him sort of having to say, this is God's going to judge these cities who have rejected me, that the people who are listening to him are going, oh man, what, if they're going to reject Jesus, how, how do I know I'm going to have the courage to trust Jesus? And if they have a hard time following Jesus, how am I going to follow Jesus? And how am I going to be right with God at all? Am I going to ever be good enough? And they're just weighed down. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 just come to me. Come to me. He says. And he uses this idea, this image of a yoke. Don't think egg yolk. <laughs> think two oxen yoked together, put together by that big wooden thing that ties two oxen together, okay? That's what he means by yoke. A yoke was often used by other rabbis to say, they would say a similar phrase. You know, let's yoke together come learn of me and you can kind of imitate what my life's like. So other rabbis would do a similar thing. Remember, it's not just about learning information, but a lifestyle. And so they would say this, be yoke with me. But the problem was the yoke that the, that the Jewish rabbis would put on people was so hard and so heavy to pull. They took 10 commandments and turned them into like 700 laws. There was just this major burden. It was so difficult to actually pull on that yoke. It was a burden. Jesus took the Ten Commandments and reduced them down to two. Love God. Love your neighbor. It's not that complicated. But more than that, listen. A yoke is also an instrument that takes the burden off of just one animal. There's this principle in physics, I think it's called synergy, where the two can pull more together than they can the sum of them pulling separately. So if you had one oxen that could pull a plow that would, would, would cut a, uh, you know, a row in the dirt that would be uh, you know, four inches deep, and you had another one who could pull a row in the dirt that was four inches deep, two together could pull one that was 12 inches deep. That's how it works. But what's interesting here, when Jesus says, take my yoke upon me, guess who's yoked with you? He is. It's like him saying, I'm going to do all the heavy lifting. All you got to do 
is walk with me. In fact, one of the things when they used to yoke oxen was they had to make sure they always had a stronger, older oxen and maybe a younger, weaker oxen, but they had to make sure that that younger oxen was ready to be submissive because if it wouldn't pull, if it wouldn't uh, submit where the older oxen went on the pole, it would pull against it and it could break its own neck and die. So it had to be ready to go, okay. The oxen had to be trained to be, okay, you're going to be in this yoke with this stronger oxen. Jesus is saying, listen, here's how it works. You're trying to pull this whole religious thing on your own. You've been trying to do religion on your own, and all it does is bring a heavy burden. He's saying, come to me, and I'll do the heavy pulling. I'll make sure you learn to cut those rows straight. I'll make sure that what gets done is far beyond what you could ever imagine. And I'll make sure you finish the work that needs to be finished in your life. I'll make it happen, he says. In fact, when he says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light, the word easy, it's a really bad translation. A lot of versions use it. It's not even the word easy. It's the word useful. Let me ask you a question. Do you think a bird is burdened by its feathers? They're so heavy. No, it's only by its feathers that a bird can fly. Have you ever seen an owl without its feathers? It's disgusting. They have these skinny little weird necks and they're just really... They, it, they're not beautiful without their feathers. Yeah. They can't fly without their feathers. Those feathers aren't a burden. It's what frees them to be able to move and to do what they're meant to, be, to do. Taking on the yoke of Jesus is not a burden. Becoming a disciple is not a burden. Following his commands is not a burden. You know why? It's what actually puts motion into what he's promised us. It's how we actually experience everything Christ came to die for. It's how we begin to live that resurrected life now, awaiting for the day when this old body will be resurrected for a new one. Being a disciple is not about following rules and regulations. It's about following a person. It's about saying, Jesus, you are worthy of my ultimate allegiance, of all my love, of all my trust, even if I have to suffer for it. That's what it means to be a disciple. That's what it means to be a Christian. 